please go to, if you want to use the social media to, uh, to connect and to get your questions and comments on that, that would be fantastic. The thought I've put here from this session, one of them was, quote, trust drives innovation. There is a lot to say about this and a lot about looking at which way around this process works. We will be having one of those polls soon, the one that I mentioned in the beginning of the Concordia Trust Summit. Get ready for that, get ready for the vote. Until then, we hear from you with the hashtag uh, Concordia23 and at Concordia Summit. But before that, before we go to the poll, we've got a very special session. We have the Honorable Avril Haynes, U.S. Director of National Intelligence. She will share her strategic expertise and discuss how the intelligence community views this issue and can work with partners across the U.S and beyond in the fight to protect against digital authoritarianism and widespread disinformation from foreign actors. Please welcome on stage Director Ariel Haynes and David Road. Hi, uh, thank you all for coming today. I'm very Lucky and excited to, to speak with Avril Haynes. My name is I'm David Rode. I'm the national security editor um, at NBC News. Um, and it, we have an amazingly challenging topic um, today in terms of how can the US government and the US intelligence community um, help prevent digital authoritarianism. I will ask tough questions also. We just talked about that um, backstage. And I, I just first want to credit um, Avril for coming out and speaking about this topic publicly. Um, I've covered the US government overseas and in the US for decades now. And I just, as a journalist, the more transparency, the better, the more that public officials come out and answer questions from me um, and from the public, the better. Well, we learn a lot from you. I was saying to David, I should be interviewing him given his extraordinary career and knowledge on these issues. Well, Please. I disagree, <laughs> but, <laughs> politely. <laughs> but um, so look, it's a, uh, AI, it, it terrifies journalists. We think there's gonna be AI you know, writing all of our stories. We won't be needed at all, but it's on a much more important level. Um, it, you know, we have a pattern in recent years, particularly the last decade of authoritarian governments. You know, there was an early idealistic view that the internet was gonna spread information freely, force societies to open up um, and be more democratic. And we yeah. see the opposite happening um, in China and Russia and, and, and other countries as well. So can you talk about um, what you see as sort of the biggest threats in terms of limiting access to the internet, how different authoritarian regimes um, are using it broadly? I'll, I'll follow up with specific questions about China and Russia, but yeah. what are the specific strategies they use to suppress dissent in, in these countries? Sure, all right, and pull the string obviously wherever you think useful, but first of all, it's very nice to be here with all of you and. Um, and I appreciate having an opportunity to talk about this subject. I think it's actually important for the intelligence communities in some respects to come out to discuss these issues, in large part to sort of say there's a difference between work that we do under a democratic government structure where we're accountable under the law and that we actually have to comply with all of the requirements of that and be held accountable. And part of being held accountable is the sort of degree to which we can promote transparency about the work that we do. And I think, you know, very much as you said, the story as I see it is we saw um, tremendous kind of communication technology facilitating in a way uh, greater uh, freedom of information and the flow of information and opportunities for uh, folks to, you know, engage in civil uh, debate and, and discussion in a variety of countries where maybe they hadn't had as many opportunities to do so. And then there was a kind of a backlash to sort of counter, in effect, the free flow of information and some of what were perceived by many governments as risks. And uh, and then there was another stage, which is I think the stage we're in now, which is where there's a harnessing of the technologies that we see to actually engage in digital repression. And this is something we put for the first time in our annual threat assessment to sort of highlight the fact that this is a rising threat, that we expect to see more of this in the coming uh, you know, year, certainly, which is what our annual threat assessment focuses on, but in the coming years, I would say. And the, the sort of developments in artificial intelligence 
students and particularly in generative AI kind of add to the challenge? And I'd sort of say maybe in three basic ways to give people a sense. I think, first of all, it is possible using artificial intelligence and sort of uh, analytics to better target the audience that you're looking to focus on. So if you are an authoritarian government and you're focused on a diaspora that is of uh, dissidents or folks that disagree in effect, um, you can use these tools in a way to better focus in on that uh, population. You can also use some of these tools, and it's not just artificial intelligence, but other technological developments combined with AI that allow you to better surveil and monitor the population that you're focused on. That can be useful insofar as you're able not only to target them with information, but also obviously to you know, communicate with them, threaten them, learn information about what they're saying and use that against them and so on. And that's a sort of a second piece of it. And then the third that I'd highlight in this context too is just the capacity to use um, generative AI in particular, we see these large language models, to engage in disinformation or in messaging to populations, not necessarily to your uh, to dissidents that are overseas, but rather to engage in kind of influence operations with more authentic messages and to be able to do so at greater scale. And those are some of the issues that, that we look at from an artificial intelligence perspective, like how is this contributing to the challenge that we're facing and exacerbating it in different spaces. But I think to, to uh, you know, David's comment too, that there are, you know, it, Artificial intelligence in and of itself is not the problem in the sense that there are also tremendous opportunities and uh, advantages that societies can gain from the development of these technologies. It's, I think, more a question of how do you manage it so as to be able to mitigate against some of the challenges that you're facing. But. Um, that's great. So it helps targeting. And we're going to get to the optimistic part here. But it, <laughs> really AI sure helps with in my world, um, targeting, surveillance, and, and disinformation. Um, and so I want to specifically ask about a couple countries. You know, we were talking backstage. I want to ask you about China. Yeah. And you said China was sort of first in class when it comes to a specific use of, of AI and suppressing dissent. Yeah, they, they are, in our view, kind of the lead uh, actor in essentially engaging in digital repression and um, and it is, you know, you can see it in a whole series of ways. They have just a, a vast apparatus that they use to engage in these kinds of activities. They, um, uh, there are reports, um, NGO reports, it's been reported in the media and so on about their Operation uh, Fox Hunt and um, Skynet and how through those operations they have captured and repatriated thousands of uh, individuals who are uh, charged with corruption, many of which though happen to also be dissidents um, and folks who express political opposition. We've seen obviously the sort of Chinese police stations around the world, including in New York City. Uh, we have seen how, you know, the Department of Justice um, uh, disclosed a number of uh, indictments, I believe it was in April, where they were basically um, taking action against uh, some of the actors who have engaged in this kind of repression, Chinese actors in this space. So I think you, you see that um, uh, more generally is sort of evidence of the structure that they have built to engage in this kind of effort. And the thing that, that I've noticed is that, you know, when you're looking at the Chinese model for this as opposed to for example, the Russian model or Iran model, and you sort of see each of them have different versions. Um, it, it, with China, they're really first in class in a sense at the technology piece of it. So they've gotten very good at uh, censoring um, effectively information that can get to individuals within China, sort of building the structure that allows them to control uh, that information. In effect, they are um, very good at the surveillance and monitoring piece. We all know that with the Internet of Things, uh, you know, the sort of um, different devices that we use, cars that are connected to the Internet, other things like that, that that creates opportunities for data to be created about your activities that can be collected and ultimately surveilled and monitored, and, and that that is part of uh, the system that can be used essentially in order to engage in this kind of um, effort. And China is, is really exceptional. 
in that space. And you mentioned Russia. Yeah. It's, is there a different approach that Vladimir Putin and, and his government uses? Yeah, in many ways, the goals are very similar. It's a lot about regime preservation, about internal control, about promoting a particular uh, perspective about um, the country and you know, exercising, in effect, global influence, depending on the particular campaigns that you're focused on. Um, but Russia does have a kind of a, a different variation on the theme, in a way, for how they go about this. And uh, they have been known as being um, quite good at disinformation and engaging in that kind of work. And one of the things that I think people um, may have noticed are the sort of uh, the deep fakes that they used to, for example, um, promote the story that the Mafka, this is the flagship uh, ship for their Black Sea Fleet, that it, it caught fire in the context of a storm as opposed to actually being hit by the Ukrainians. And that was a, a kind of a disinformation campaign that they were promoting and they used deep fake technology for doing that. And they engage in a fair amount, obviously, of this kind of activity. But but what I've also found very interesting about the Russians is that there's a, an extraordinary legal and organizational structure around their efforts. So, for example, um, and it's not as if the Chinese don't do versions of this, but in the context of the Ukraine conflict, they passed laws that said you will go to jail for 15 years if you report certain types of information, right, that type of thing. So they create that sort of criminal uh, framework. They also have... Um, government requirements where you have to register your website, you put in bandwidth information, you do a variety of things. They're trying to push effectively everybody onto certain platforms that give them more control over the information. Uh, they have um, promoted certain uh, business models, effectively like suggesting that Russian companies should do indigenous platforms, uh, use indigenous platforms for their communication, for their public work, so that they can, again, manage the information more effectively. We've also seen it in the occupied uh, areas of Ukraine where they're trying to control the information in those spaces as well. So it's a, a kind of a a combination of things that you see in each country in a way has a slightly different version of these things, but it's also, it's part of a playbook. And I think it's one of the things that we've been trying to highlight from the intelligence community perspective, all the different ways in which these uh, strategies in effect intersect and make it easier for them to do some of the work that they're doing in terms of controlling information internally and externally. And then I, I just have to ask you this, because I. I I think in an American audience, this the skepticism of government will be here. Fair I mean, enough. what can you say to Americans about that? That you know, as ODNI, that the U.S. intelligence community is not going to use AI for these kinds of purposes to yeah. to improperly track people. Um, there are checks and balances, but I think people don't know about them or or they don't sort of believe in them. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very fair question. And like I said, it's part of why I'm out here doing this, because I think there is a, a perfectly reasonable question to be asked about, like, so don't you do this, right? Like, what is the difference in effect? And, and I think there's a very sharp difference. So here's an example. Of course, we also surveil, right? Like, that's not you know, the fact that a country is surveilling, I think, is not the, um, f from my perspective, that is something that can and should be done. But it has to be done under a very strict legal framework that is effectively, um, that, that allows you as a citizen of the United States to say, okay, if the government is surveilling an actor, for example, in the context of uh, a criminal commission of a crime or um, for law enforcement purposes or, um, uh, or even in the context of foreign surveillance because of a national security threat that you're concerned about, that they will only do so under the authorities that we pass that allow them to do that, right? And for reasons that we believe are legitimate reasons for doing so. And when they get that information, they can only basically disseminate it to individuals who are allowed to see it for purposes of addressing the particular mission that you're focused on, right? And they can only use it for certain purposes that are permitted under the structure that we've effectively put forward. So if I, you know, if we're in the intelligence community and we have collected information 
about an individual, there are all kinds of, first of all, we have to have had a valid reason for doing so. We have to have a series of constraints around that information. And I certainly could not use that information if I had uh, information about a US person abroad. Like, under no circumstances would it be acceptable for us to basically use that to try to coerce the individual to take a different position politically or to stop uh, engaging in political discourse or to stop criticizing the US government or any of those things. And we have enormous safeguards around our work in order to prevent that from happening. And it's not as if we don't make mistakes. We definitely do at times. But there has to be accountability when that occurs and corrections to the system so that we can't do it in the future. And that's that is part of you know the sort of bread and butter of what we're doing. We're going through a reauthorization of one of our main surveillance authorities. This is something that comes up on a regular basis. This is something that we have to work with Congress and the American public on. I talk to civil liberties and NGOs about their concerns. We talk through what are the things that we can do better or what are the, the mechanisms that can give them greater trust in our process. Because I think you know this is one of the challenges for intelligence community work, so much of what we do has to be in secret in order for us to be effective. But that doesn't mean that we can't tell you, here's, here are the lines, right? And here is what we're going to report on. And here is the information that allows you to feel comfortable at the end of the day that we're, in fact, acting in accordance with the law. And we work with our Congress, obviously, where they can see everything and ultimately ensure that we are acting consistent with the law on these issues. And one last, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to get kicked off the stage. Oh. You. You know, just the, again, this, the note of optimism that you think there are uh, strategies that can be used, one being transparency to sort of expose what these authoritarian governments are doing yeah. and where th that can help counter this. You can use even AI. Uh, again, transparency, norms, you'd mentioned a few things. I do. I, I Part of what, what we're trying to do is lift up the different strategies, mechanisms, technologies that are being used in digital uh, repression. and. Um, and our hope is that this gives, frankly, the private sector, the public sector, policy makers, others, opportunities to think through how it is that they can make it harder for governments to engage in this work. So the president uh, issued executive order that basically puts export controls over commercial spyware. That's an example of what the government can do to make this more difficult, in effect. Um, but there are other things, you know, technological standards, ways for creating the architecture architecture of uh, you know, the internet and other things, so many Western companies are involved in that work and they can help us to get better at making the cost of this higher and making it more challenging. And I think there's also you know, obviously the development of norms in these areas which folks are working on, which are critically important, I think, to again, raising the cost of this. And hopefully we can also support essentially you know, through our own engagements with partners ways to do this that would reduce some of the challenges. And I do think AI, you know, like with all technologies, I want to make sure that we're not losing the opportunities that these technologies can provide to us while we're nevertheless mitigating some of the threats and managing that risk is obviously so much a part of my job. I like to end on optimistic notes, but it rarely happens, I would say. So I don't appreciate the... Well, I'm, I'm, the fact that you came out here and are, are out talking to the public about these, these issues is, makes me optimistic. So thank you very much, Director Haynes, for coming. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. To, to be continued, we will be talking about AI and democracy and repression for years to come. But thank you Yeah, that's so for much. sure. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you.